Well, hello, everyone. I hope that you're all doing well. Um, my name is Nate Johnson, and um, I'm coming to you from St. Louis. I'm looking forward to talking with you about some of the challenges that exist in terms of creating equitable communities, uh, certainly in Orange County, but all over the country, quite frankly. And one of the things that I recognize is that in order for us to understand where we're at today and how we got here, we need to know where we've been because only then are we gonna be able to take the steps necessary to create the equitable future that all of our neighborhoods uh, deserve. So with that, let's kick it off. We're gonna take a bit of a history lesson. By the way, feel free to, in the chat box, ask questions, make comments, and I'll be monitoring that uh, as well. So I would love to be able to answer any questions or address any specific comments that you have. Don't feel like you're interrupting my flow as we have this, as we have this communication. I'd love to answer the questions and make sure that you get the information that you came here to get. So let's kick it off with our history lesson here and go back in time just a little bit. So um, anybody remember 1865? Anybody? 1865, a little bit, a little bit further back in time. Um, Okay, what was happening in 1865? What we know is that in 1865, we were at a space where the Civil War was ending in the United States. And we had some challenges to say the very least in terms of what our communities were going to look like because we had all of these freed men and women. And the question becomes, what rights are they gonna have? What opportunities are, gonna, are they gonna have in the United States? So. It was President Lincoln who said at the time, with malice towards none and charity for all, let's heal the nation's wounds. He recognized the importance of bringing us all together as a community. And the only way to do that was to figure out what rights would be afforded to everyone and to work to create, um, uh, and, and create uh, unity in our nation. So he went and sent, dispatched his general General George Tecumseh Sherman, because one of the things that not everybody's aware of is that back in the 1860s, when the enslaved African Americans were freed, there was no, there was no um, automatic set of rights that they were going to be afforded. They didn't get a, um, they didn't get any housing vouchers or hotel voucher or anything like that. It was literally, okay, you're free now and off you went to fend for yourselves. So most of the time, the African-Americans were sleeping in the streets. They were relying on the kindness of others to help them. And in many cases, they had to stay there and on the very plantations where uh, they were owned because they had no other alternative. They had no other, other opportunities. So President Lincoln dispatched his general, General George Tecumseh Sherman. And he asked an important question. He asked, what is it that you want? And this is important because this is not something that you typically would expect that uh, someone in 1865 is going to be asking of African Americans in terms of what rights they were, you know, that, that they needed and what opportunities they were really looking for. But that's exactly what General uh, Sherman did. He said, what is it that you want? And, you know, what Garrison Frazier said, Garrison Frazier was a leader, a formerly enslaved man, and he was a leader of the freedmen. And um, he was speaking on behalf of the freedmen and women in the United States. And what he said, what he said to General Sherman, he said, well, we need land because if we have land, we're going to be able to till the soil with our own hands. We're going to be able to um, build homes and grow crops and, and be self-sufficient in this country. And that's what he said to General Sherman. And General Sherman said, well, hey, that makes a lot of sense to me. So that was the message that was relayed to President Lincoln. So as a result, President Lincoln also said, that makes sense. And from there, he issued what we know as Special Field Order Number 15. And what this said is that the islands from Charleston south, the abandoned rice fields along the river for 30 miles back from the sea, and the country bordering the St. John's River in Florida are reserved and set apart for the settlement of Negroes now made free by acts of war and by proclamation of the President of the United States. 
And you might be thinking, whoa, what's going on here? You're, sound, you're telling me in 1865, um, uh, African-Americans had land set aside for them to settle? That's exactly right. And that's, we, you, know, you may hear that known as 40 acres and a mule. Now, the 40 acres was sure enough, there was no mule involved. Now, the challenge that the African-Americans ran into was um, President Lincoln's love for the theater. Because as we all know, our president had a really rough night at the Ford Theater not too long after that and was assassinated. As a result, that ushered in someone else. His successor, Andrew Johnson, stepped in as president of the United States. He had a completely different view on what rights the um, former enslaved people would have in our country. And he said, what? Give them this land? Are you kidding me? I'm not giving them this land. Um, so he stripped the land back that he that were set aside for the African Americans that were made free, and he gave it back to the former slave owners. And re he repealed Special Field Order Number 15. But we still had a challenge here because we still had to get to a space to understand what rights these folks are going to have in our country. So then it was left up to Congress. And Congress, in 1865, passed the Civil Rights Act. Now, say they passed the Civil Rights Act, they moved forward this legislation and sent it to the president. And what it said is that such citizens of every race and color, and without regard of any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, shall have the same right in every state and territory as is enjoyed by white citizens to en enforce laws, to own and convey real and personal property. So we're talking about real estate here. So there we had it, 1866, we've got the Civil Rights Act. Now, went to the president's desk, it was vetoed by President Johnson. Um, Congress sent it back again, vetoed a second time by President Johnson. And it wasn't until there was a two thirds majority vote by Congress that the Civil Rights Bill became law. So there we have it. 1866, racism in America is a thing of the past. Housing discrimination is over. Okay, all right. Maybe not, maybe not. Um, you're right, we didn't quite get there in 1866. However, we did enter reconstruction during this time. And what was happening when re with reconstruction was rather phenomenal because when we look at what was happening in our Congress, in 1870, we had the first African-American congressman, Senator Hiram Revels of Mississippi and Representative Joseph Rainey from South Carolina. They became the first African-Americans to serve in Congress. And this was in 1870. And now the thing is, is that I talk about Senator Hiram Revels in 1870 in Mississippi, and it would be nearly a hundred years before we would see another African-American senator. And this is after 1877. Now, why was that? Similarly, it would be another 100 years before we would see the amount of representation um, from African-Americans in Congress. And one of the things that caused that is we bring in a new era. Um, 1877, this who you see here is Rutherford B. Hayes. He is um, the governor of Ohio at the time. He was running for president against Samuel Tilden, who was New York's governor. And what occurred here is it was a very contentious race. We didn't know who was going to emerge from this contest victorious and would serve as the next president of the United States. So Rutherford B. Hayes talked to the not yet reconstructed states in the South and said, hey, talk to the leaders and said, hey, you know what? If you support me in the presidency, in my, in, my, in, my, uh, in my quest to become president, then I will remove the remaining troops from the South. And we'll let you deal with this problem in the way that you see fit. So that's exactly what happened. He was able to, the, the, Southern, the Southerners supported him. So as a result, he was elected president and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He removed all of the remaining Southern troops and let the Southerners handle this problem the way that they saw fit. And as a result, 
it ushered in a completely new era. And that era we call the Jim Crow era. And what happened with Jim Crow, um, W.E. Du Bois said, um, um, he said that the, the Negro stood for a brief moment in the sun and then was ushered back into slavery and oppression. Uh, W.E.D. Bois, um, uh, Frederick Douglass had similar comments as well at the time. And then that takes us to the early 1900s, 1910 to be exact. And in 1910, we, had, we saw about 90% of African-Americans lived in the US South. And just about 50, year, 50 years later, that number was cut in half. And we know that as the Great Migration. The Great Migration uh, took place and that really shifted where, shifted where African Americans in our country lived because uh, they were looking to escape those oppressive conditions of the South and head North and West uh, for better opportunities. And that was all well and good, except for, you know, um, not everybody wanted that. So in fact, if we look in uh, your part of town, if you look in Manhattan Beach, for example, Bruce's Beach, a once thriving resort for black families, which was owned by Willa and Charles Bruce, was seized by the town of Manhattan Beach in 1924 with the stated goal of building a park. And what we know is that historical records, which included a raft of complaints from white neighbors at the time, showed that the land was condemned because the proprietors were black. So this was happening in California. This was happening all over the country. And this is also where we as realtors got involved because we as realtors amended our code of ethics in 1924 and we added article, article 34. And article 34 of our own code of ethics because at the time, of course, we're looking to figure out, man, what, you know, what's happening here? We've got African-Americans leaving the oppressive South and coming to these other places. And the sentiment was that your average white family did not want African-Americans as their neighbors. So we as realtors got involved and in our code of ethics, we amended it and added article 34. Article 34 stated that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood, a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in the neighborhood. That was us. That was our code of ethics in 1924. Now, you, know, you might be saying to yourself, well, Nate, I wasn't around in 1924. Why are you saying that was us? I didn't make any of those decisions. And when I talk about that us, I talk about it in the sort of, in, in, the, in the larger sense of the word, because it's all of us as realtors Myself as an African American, I wouldn't have even been able to be a member of our association in 1924, let alone make the decision about who was going to be included in housing opportunities and who was going to be excluded. But what I recognize is that we all own this. We're all realtors, so we have to do everything that we can to create better outcomes for everyone because we're responsible for it. So, for example, in the words of Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote the phenomenal book, Cast, she says that it's like a house. You know, you buy a house that's 100 years old, and certainly in the case of the National Association of Realtors, it's over 100 years old. So it's about 130 years old. So you buy a house that's 130 years old, although you didn't build that house, you're responsible for it. We're responsible for upkeeping, for improving it for maintenance, all of these things. It's our house, so we, it's our responsibility to make it as good as it possibly can be. So that's when I talk about we and us, because it's all of us, because we all benefit from this and we all suffer from it, every one of us. So as a result, we have to take proactive measures to ensure that we're creating the equitable, equitable outcomes for our neighborhoods and for our communities. So let's fast forward a little bit. So here we've got President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This was 1933, this was the New Deal. And the New Deal, of course, was a jobs program because what we know what was happening in during the 1930s in the United States, we had the Great Depression. I mean, we had, it was really, really rough economic conditions to say the least. People were in line for soup. People were beginning to wonder if our fragile democracy is really worth saving. 
because what we know is that you know we've got a drumbeat of war marching across europe some areas there were seemingly having prosperous conditions so we had to do something so that's where the new deal came in from franklin delano roosevelt uh, fdr passed the new deal and it was a jobs program it was meant to put men back to work and i say men back to work because women weren't really included in the workforce at that time you know they did not represent a large share of employment uh, in the United States. So that was the goal of the New Deal. And part of that was the passage of the National Housing Act in 1934. And what the National Housing Act did was create the FHA. And what we know is that the FHA uh, is used to help provide, help provide low down payment options, make credit more available to banks so that they can invest in home ownership in communities. Because in our country, in the 1930s, we were not a nation of homeowners. The rate of home ownership was around 35% or so. And if we fast forward just about 50 years from there, that rate of home ownership doubled. And then today, we see that among white families, the rate of home ownership is nearly 75%. And um, the challenge is that not everyone has achieved that level of home ownership in our country. And one of the challenges that has sort of created some adverse outcomes is the FHA loan. Because I mentioned it was available in 1934. And in the years, in the next, in, in the next, in, in the next 30 years, up until we get to the Fair Housing Act, or the uh, Civil Rights Act of um, uh, the uh, the Civil Rights Act and Fair Housing Act of 1964-1968, what we know is that less than 2% of FHA loans were issued to non-white families in our country. 2%, less than two. So that's significant. And that really sort of cemented the uh, housing gap and the economic gap in uh, the United States. Because what we all know is that people achieve so many things through home ownership. It's the bedrock and cornerstone. I don't have to tell you all of this, you're realtors, but it's the cornerstone and bedrock of uh, economic empowerment in our nation and steps towards building financial independence and financial freedom. We know that the equity that we build in our homes can be used to send our kids to school, to start businesses, to you know take care of something that's needed in a rainy day. We know that that's there. We know the benefit of that. One of the things that FHA did was it implemented these maps. And we as realtors were involved in the creation of these maps. Here we are, as in your, what you are very familiar with, we've got Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda. Um, so the Homeowner Loan Corporation worked with local realtors in 239 cities across our country to create these residential security maps. We know them as red line maps. And what they did was, they were meant to distinguish the least risky neighborhoods for lending, shaded in green and yellow, from the most risky neighborhoods that were in, um, uh, that were in red. And it, again, it wasn't just Oakland. Here was a map of Los Angeles uh, as well, 1939. This is all over the country, all over the country. The FHA underwriting map, uh, guideline, underwriting manual said they had racial descriptors in here. So here you talk about, you'll see, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, um, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial class. A change in social and racial occupancy generally contributes to the instability and a decline in values. This is the FHA underwriting manual. This is 1938. And we as realtors had a part in helping to create this. Um, it also said recorded deed restrictions should strengthen and supplement zoning ordinance and um, deed restrictions. So racially restrictive deed restrictions were championed by the FHA. And not only were they championed by the FHA, they were almost mandated because if you wanted FHA lending in a neighborhood, you needed to have these restrictive covenants that would say, who was able to occupy the premises and who was not, more importantly. Uh, prohibition of occupancy by property of properties except by the race for which they are intended. 
This is all the government FHA underwriting manual in 1938. So that brought about a lot of things. That brought about the signs that we would see all over. We want white tenants in our white community, uh, Christians only, Jews not welcome, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Yes, Irish. Not everyone is aware that how heavily discriminated the Irish were. And in fact, most first and second generation immigrants to our nation felt that level of discrimination, Italians uh, and, and so on and so forth. And um, the challenge that we've got is that, uh, you know, many people of color, people of color did not necessarily, were not necessarily able to, quote, assimilate into a uh, general, quote, white population because of the color of our skin. So as a result, although uh, groups like the Irish and the Italian and uh, Jews, so on and so forth, were able to sort of integrate into society, people of color didn't have that opportunity. Uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, Asians, and so on. Um, and that continues to be a struggle to this very day. And it's not something that we've solved by some of these laws and policies that we've created. Um, it's something that still exists because we haven't changed the hearts and minds of people. Because until we change the hearts and minds of people and educate people to get them to a space of understanding that these issues still exist, then we're not gonna get to where we really deserve and where our communities really deserve to be. We also have a uh, restrictive covenant here, that, you, as you see. The text reads, none of the said lands interest therein or improvements therein shall be sold, resold, conveyed, leased, rented to, or in any way used or occupied or acquired by any person of Negro blood or to any person of the Semitic race, blood, or origin whose racial description shall be deemed to include Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Persians, or Syrians. And that was, uh, those were prominent all across our country. Um, and in fact, uh, to this day, they still exist in many neighborhoods all over our country. Of course, they're not enforceable, but the text remains. And when that text remains, you know, and if you happen to be one of these excluded groups, how do you feel when you read those documents? Do you feel like you're welcome in that neighborhood? when that neighborhood didn't find it valuable enough to remove this hateful language and restrictive language from its own documents. So that's a challenge that we continue to face uh, nationwide. So that takes us to the 1940s. So here we are again in Orange County. This is in LA. In 1942, in response to the success of some Negroes moving out of the LA ghetto and moving into of uh, traditionally all white neighborhoods, the California Real Estate Association formed its Race Restriction Committee. And the purpose of the committee was to establish perpetual race restrictions on, partial, uh, on parcels of property. This here is uh, Sugar Hill as an example of that. Um, when, as the, you know, during times of the depression where a lot of the white families just could no longer afford some of these properties, they begin to sell them to uh, some prominent Negroes who had the opportunity and could afford it. Picture there is Hattie McDaniel, Academy Award winner Hattie McDaniel. She moved to the Sugar Hill neighborhood. But of course, what we know um, is that, is that, um, is that after this occurred, we saw the restrictive covenants that really, really, that really destroyed a lot of these neighborhoods, and um, because the the desire was that we don't want African Americans to live here, we don't want them in our neighborhoods, and that was that was a that was a real problem. That was a real problem in Los Angeles, in Orange County, all over our country. This was a problem, and that we continue to deal with. Uh, today, certainly. So um, the Bernal House. So in 1943, uh, Alexandro Bernal and his family moved to a house on Ash Avenue in the Sunnyside neighborhood of Fullerton. So what happened is that three days after the Bernals moved in, the former owners told them that they might have a little trouble because of the deed restriction that was attached to the house. And that restriction was similar to what I read before, which talked about no, none of the said land shall be leased, owned, or occupied in any way by any Mexicans or persons 
other than the Caucasian race. So as a result, the Bernal's neighbors, um, you know, thought that the presence of Mexicans in their neighborhood would lower their property value. So, um, you know, they didn't fail to prevent the Bernal's from moving in, but the white neighborhoods and the, the, the white residents in the community hired a lawyer to file an injunction against the family requesting their removal from the house. A month later, the Bernal's received a summons from the Orange County Sheriff's deputy to appear in Orange County Superior Court, and the lawsuit was filed on behalf of the majority of all the other lot owners of the Sunnyside edition, and it requested judicial enforcement of the racial restriction while also asking that the court ban the Bernal's from living in their own home. So uh, they refused to leave. The Bernal's, to their credit, refused to leave. They hired an attorney who successfully made the legal argument that Mexicans were subject to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, the Superior Court judge in Orange County made the decision that ensured that the Bernal's right to keep their home. Here is uh, the California Eagle newspaper. They concluded that this decision may be an important instrument in helping to solve serious wartime housing solution in the LA area as it applies to Mexicans and especially to Negro families. So this is a piece of history that you in Orange County have a part in. Because as I stated before, you know, sometimes people think that these are things that happen just in the South or just in certain parts of our country, but this was all over. This was all over. Uh, here's an example. This is Levittown, New York. Levittown, New York in the mid 1940s. Now, what was happening in the 1940s as we just discussed with the Bernal case is that World War II was ending. World War II was ending and we've got the soldiers coming home. We've got the boys coming home from war and they need housing. We have a real housing shortage. Now, you might think you have an inventory shortage right now in Orange County. Let me tell you about an inventory shortage. In Levittown, New York, when they built these homes in 1947, I believe is what's, what we have pictured here, and they, when they were taking reservations, they reserved 1,200 homes in the first three hours. In the first three hours that this development was taking reservations, 1,200 homes. That's a housing shortage. And although African-Americans, Hispanics, Jews and others were working on these homes and building them, none of them were able to occupy these properties. Uh, Levittown, which is named after Will William Levitt, uh, who himself was Jewish, would not allow Jews to purchase in the neighborhood and, or, nor occupy the, in the neighborhood. And that was due to FHA guidelines. This was an FHA project. And the Federal Housing Administration said, hey, look, we're not financing this project if this is not a segregated community. We don't finance integrated communities. And Levitt said, hey, look, we've got a racial problem and a housing problem. I'm gonna solve the housing problem. And that's what he did. There's a half dozen places around the East Coast called Levittown named after, uh, named after this group. And it became the model for suburban development nationwide, all the way down to the racially based restrictive covenants. So, African Americans, Hispanics, other minorities had opportunities to achieve home ownership, but they weren't able to do so in the Levittowns of the world. They were able to buy homes on the other side of the tracks, so to speak. And what was happening there on the other side of the tracks are, you know, these are places that no one would want to really live in. You know, they wouldn't want, you know, they'd allow the liquor stores to move in. They would allow you know, industry to move in next door, the pig farm, uh, you know, they build the highway right next to it. So these are things that people don't want. They weren't maintaining the neighborhoods at the same level. Um, the construction was shoddy. Now let's talk about housing values for a moment because Levittown, these homes were very affordable. They cost about $8,000 in the 1940s, which is twice the median income average in our nation. And so that's about $100,000 in today's dollars. So if we look across the street where minorities were able to purchase homes, same price, that $8,000 or $100,000 in today's dollars. Now, as I talked about, there's a lot of challenges that really uh, worked to sort of keep down the uh, uh, home value appreciation in some of the minority neighborhoods. 
So as a result, when we fast forward 70 years later, what we know is that the homes in Levittown are routinely trading for four and $500,000. And that's great. But the homes across the street or on the other side of the tracks where minorities were able to invest in home ownership are still selling for about $100,000 today. So over a period of 60, 70 years, we saw little to zero wealth accumulation in some of these communities. And that's one of the challenges that bring us to where we're at today. This is why we have this uh, racial wealth gap in our nation. I mentioned the housing uh, home ownership gap, 75% among white families, African-Americans, 43% is the rate of home ownership uh, in the United States among African-American families. So we're talking about a 30% difference in rates of home ownership. And, you know, people will tell me, well, Nate, we had the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which we'll talk about in a minute. Didn't that solve it? Didn't we make housing available for everyone at that moment? Well, we didn't, but let's pretend that we did. Okay, let's pretend that we did. Let's say that in 1968, we did just that. In 1968, racism was over, housing discrimination was a thing of the past, and from that moment forward, everyone had equal opportunities to achieve home ownership in any neighborhood that they could afford. That would have been great, by the way. Almost brings a tear to my eye. Just imagining an America where that is the reality. And not even that that is the reality in 1968, but if that were the reality in 2022, because we still haven't arrived. We still have not arrived at fair housing. But let me get back on track of what I was talking about. Going back to 1968, if that solved everything, what happened in the 20 or 30 years prior to that? You know, we've created opportunities for some citizens in our nation, but other folks were left behind. You know, think about it in terms of monopoly. We're all realtors. We play monopoly. So what happens when <clears throat> you go around go? Or more to the point, what happens if you're not allowed to go around, uh, go around the board, if you're stuck in jail or whatever? So imagine playing monopoly and somebody is able to, or one group or several groups are stuck on go while other groups are able to go around the board two and three, maybe four times. What's going to happen there? Well, we know what's going to happen. All the properties are going to be bought. There are going to be houses and hotels built on them. I mean, if you're lucky, you might be able to get Mediterranean and Baltic Avenue, if you're lucky. But the high quality prime location properties, those aren't going to be available anymore. So this is exactly what's happened in our nation, except for people didn't get to go around the board two and three and four times. People got to go around the board 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 years before others were able to even have an opportunity to occupy homes in some of these neighborhoods that are the most sought after. And that's what we have to consider. And that's how come where we're at today um, isn't the solution. And how come what we saw a hundred years ago was really the genesis of what has led us to the economic and housing racial gaps that we see in the United States today. So if we fast forward from Levittown, move forward just a couple of years, we get to Shelley versus Kramer. This is 1948. Now, the United, uh, the United States Supreme Court made a decision in 1948. So this was the Shelley family, family African-American family, was seeking to own a home and uh, was seeking to buy a home. The Kramer family said, hey, hey, look, we've got these restrictive covenants. Black folks are not allowed to live in, these, in this neighborhood. Now, the Shelley family had an ally because you might be asking yourself, well, how did they even get in the neighborhood if there are restrictive covenants? Well, <clears throat> their attorney, a white attorney, by the way, thought that, you know, believed that, you know, everyone should have the opportunity to live in any neighborhood that they can afford. So they acted as straw buyers to help the Shelley family buy this home in this neighborhood. Kramer family sued, said, nope, you're black, you gotta get out of here. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, they kind of punted. Okay, 
I, I mean, to be clear, this was a this was a landmark decision. It did a lot of good, blah, 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 blah. But let me tell you what it didn't do. OK, so I'll tell you what it did do to start. What it did was it said that racially based restrictive covenants on their face are not invalid under the 14th Amendment. So they're not invalid. And then they went on to say that private parties may voluntarily abide by the terms of the of a restrictive covenant, meaning that if you've got, you know, if, if, if somebody owns a home in a neighborhood and they say, you know what, the, the covenants say only white families are allowed, I'm not going to sell my home to anybody that's not white. No recourse, no problems there. That would be permissible based on the 1948 Supreme Court decision. However, what they also said was that there would be no state or judicial action to enforce such a restrictive covenant. Meaning that if someone did say, hey, I'm gonna sell my house to whoever's money's green and they moved into the neighborhood, then there would not be any legal action that would get them thrown out of the neighborhood. Now, that's what the Supreme Court said, okay? So that did create opportunities. And the reason why you know, I'm not terribly excited about it is because it didn't go far enough. It should have deemed these restrictive covenants illegal in 1948 instead of waiting another 20 years to 1968. Uh, but anyhow, it did create some opportunities. And by the way, if uh, the prominent businessman or the judge or the chief of the police department lives in the neighborhood where all of a sudden a minority family moves in and they're not champions of this, you don't think that they've got a little bit of sway that could create some legal action and court action to make sure that this minority family is moved on? Yeah, of course they would. So this was a case, it moved us down the road, but we didn't get there. And remember, we had the first Civil Rights Act in 1866, that should have solved it, it didn't, but we're getting better. We get, take baby steps. You know, it's not something that, that happens overnight, certainly. So from there, um, we saw the Housing Act of 1949, and what it did was, it was its goal was to address the decline of some of these urban neighborhoods, um, you know, following the exodus to the suburbs, because as the suburbs were created, um, there were certain families that had access to those suburbs, but who was left behind were folks that were not able to leave because African Americans, Hispanics, others, you know, Im other immigrants uh, as well were stuck in some of these ghettos of this urban core. And there was a lack of investment in infrastructure. So the plan was that we're going to just clear out these places. Urban renewal, they called it, often dubbed Negro removal, by the way. And what they did is they, they destroyed a lot of these places that people only, that people knew as their home. They lived there for generations and they were dispersed all over the place as a result of that. That ushered in the era of the high rise public housing developments, which was a, did not work well at all. This one here is Pruitt Igo. The Pruitt side was for white families, the Igo side for African Americans and you know, what was happening here, this, was, this one was in St. Louis, it was first occupied in 1954. And this image is probably from the mid 60s or so, the arch is there. Um, so we know that it was after, after 1965. Um, so what happened here is that you've got a somewhat of an integration-ish, but as you know, with, tenant, with public housing, the goal was that, the thought was that people would live here temporarily, they would get on their feet, they would go rent a house or buy a house somewhere else. And a lot of families were able to do that. But there were a lot of families that just did not have that opportunity because there were few people that were willing to even sell properties to them. So as a result, they were left behind. So now we've got a space where we've got a lack of investment in infrastructure. Um, we've got uh, overcrowded conditions because there's nowhere else to go. The elevators aren't working. The HVAC system's broken. We've got all kinds of things happening there. Police presence is down. So now crime is going through the roof. Um, got all kinds of issues there. So it was a mess. Um, and people were looking for a way to escape. How do you get out of these conditions? Well, someone, a group, 
Many of us as realtors were involved in this, by the way. We came in and as blockbusters. So blockbusters, blockbusters did a couple of things. Okay, so first they were peddling fear. So they would go to the existing white homeowners and say, hey, did you see what happened? You know, the Smith family down the street just sold their home to one of those people. You better sell me your house while you still can. Oh, at a discount, by the way, because I'm going to pay cash and I'm going to be able to move right now. And nobody else is going to buy your place. So you better sell it to me while you still can before properties, real property values really go down. Okay. So that's the fear that these blockbusters were peddling. And, you know, it worked. Your average white family would succumb to that fear that was being peddled. Now, let's be clear. Let's be clear here, because I'm not here to demonize anyone. You know, it's not, um, it, it, you know, we're talking about the 1950s. There was a different time. And what we know is that people, their only impression of certain groups of people was what they heard on the news, what they were taught by their family, what they learned in schools, what their teachers taught them, what the media portrayed on the on the, on the uh, movies and in the, the radio and, and all of that. And it wasn't positive. It wasn't positive for most minorities. So as a result, when the blockbusters were coming saying, hey, you better sell me your house while you still can, it was no surprise that people succumbed to that fear. They also could have known something else. That other thing is that if you're in a neighborhood that's integrated, FHA, is not going to provide financing. So now not only do you have an integrated neighborhood and you fear property values going down, but you're not going to be able to sell your home to anybody else because FHA is not financing in integrated neighborhoods. So that was another problem. And this is why people were succumbing to the fear that the blockbusters were peddling. So that was part of it. The other part was that the blockbusters would then go back to places like this these overcrowded slum conditions as we discussed. And they would say, hey, we've got a housing opportunity for you. Don't you wanna own your own home? And people would say, yeah, of course I do. I've been dying to own my own home, but nobody will give me an opportunity. I'll give you an opportunity, says the blockbuster. So then the blockbuster, quote, sells the property to the, um, the uh, desperate, African-American in this example. And what happens is they sell it, again, quote, sell on contract for deed. Now, contract for deed is, um, is a financing mechanism which gives you zero home ownership uh, until you've made your final payment. So let's say that you get a 10-year note contract for deed. You make the payment on time every month, nine and a half years, you know, you get tripped up, you miss a payment. You get evicted and the home goes back to the blockbuster and you have nothing. You've accrued no equity whatsoever. And the blockbusters were really savvy at this. They were building in these clauses and conditions and things to trip people up and balloon uh, you know, balloon payments and things like that because they wanted to get these houses back because guess what they could do? They could turn around and sell them again to another unsuspecting African-American family. In Chicago, Chicago alone, there was a Duke University study that showed that three quarters of all homes that were sold to black Chicagoans in the 50s and 60s were contract for deed. They were marked up 84%. So as a result of this, Black Chicagoans alone um, were, 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 were um, it destroyed three to four billion dollars of wealth just in that community, just in the Black Chicago community. Think about what that looked like nationwide, because again, this was not something that was isolated in any particular part of the country. This was all over the country. And it's unfortunate, but that's where we were. And that's another thing that really limited access to housing and really limited the opportunities for economic empowerment in our nation.
So let's move forward a little bit. Anybody have any questions or comments at this point, by the way? Now, let me take a quick peek at the chat here. I think it escaped from my screen. And let me make sure that uh, if you've got something, let me know. Let's see. Let's see, okay. Doesn't look like we have anything. Any questions there? Um, oh, thanks, Cassie. Um, all right, so we'll continue. And yeah, if you, again, if you've got any questions or comments that you'd like to bring up, feel free to throw them in the chat. And um, if I don't see it, then um, Cassie or Elsie will see it and hopefully bring it to my attention so that we can discuss it. Again, I'm happy to discuss some of these challenges that, that we've seen in terms of creating, uh, creating um, you know, equal rights in our country as it relates to housing opportunities. So let's fast forward a little bit. So um, Charlotte Bronte said that prejudices, it is well known, are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soul has never been loosened or fertilized by education. They grow there, firm as weeds among rocks. And I think that that's part of the challenge that we have is that, you know, education, we don't educate each other enough to understand the history of what's happened and to really understand what we need to do to move forward unified as a community, as a nation. So let's go to Levittown again. Remember, we talked about Levittown in New York in the 1940s and what happened. So this one here is Levittown, Pennsylvania, and this was in 1957. So in 1957, William and Daisy Myers moved their family into, 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 into town. And they were the first African-Americans who purchased a home there. Now, these folks were, she was a school teacher. He was an engineer. These are the types of folks that anybody would want to have as their neighbors, except for they were black. And the question becomes, how do you think they were welcomed as the first African-American family to move into this neighborhood. Well, I've got a quick video for you to take a look at, and this hopefully will give you a bit of a sense of, of what we were, of, of what was being dealt with at the time. And we understood that it was going to be all white, and we were very happy to buy a home here. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that, well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. But there are others who are for the Myers? Yes, I've read about them. For what reason, do you think, do they support the Myers? Frankly, I don't know what reasons they can have for it. If there are homeowners in Levittown, I don't see what reasons they can have for it. Do you think Myers will be able to live here comfortably? Comfortably? No. What course of action are you going to follow? I'll do what I can uh, to help to, to get them out legally and peacefully. And as far as accepting them socially, if that's what you mean, I could never do that. Do you think the Myers will be able to live comfortably in Levittown? I think so. I hope so. I think the majority of people here will uh, grow accustomed to it and uh, realize that, oh, they, are, they can be good neighbors, which I'm sure they are. And uh, I think the majority of people here are not vi the violent, um, well, violent group that we have heard so much about. Okay, so we've got two perspectives there. We've got two perspectives. And the first woman, as you heard, she said, huh, I could never accept the, the Myers family. You mean socially? Or what, are you kidding me? Basically, like it was a laughable thought that she would accept um, this family into her neighborhood. And she said, we're going to do whatever we can to get them out legally. There's no legal way to get them out, by the way. You know, once folks are in there, they're there because the restrictive covenants, you know, are, are not, are, are, you know, are not legally enforceable. So that was a. Uh, so that was her perspective. Now, again, I'm not here to demonize her and what she was saying. This is 1957. There was a lot of different things going on. It's likely that she never knew, or you know, certainly in a meaningful way, any African Americans because we weren't going to school together, uh, weren't working together, 
certainly weren't playing together and socializing together. So again, the only thing that she knows is what her family has told her, what her upbringing and her lived experience has told her uh, from a distance about how these people are, right? So that was the challenge that, that she had. Now, she also may know or may understand the realities of FHA financing. Hey, if the Myers family move in, then we're gonna have a problem selling our house to anybody because I bought a home in this neighborhood and I understood it was gonna be a white neighborhood and I was happy to do that. That's how it was marketed. That's why she moved in there with her family, okay? So that's her perspective. So then we had the second woman. Her perspective was, hey, I'm sure the Myers family are good neighbors. I'm not gonna have a problem with them. Most people, most people aren't gonna have a problem with them in the neighborhood. Pay no attention to that violent type who's out there. They don't speak for all of us, basically is what she was saying. Um, and this is what, this is the type of neighbor that you'd want. You know, this is the type of person that would probably bake a pie or a cake or bring you a plant when you move in and say, you know, maybe to the Myers family, hey, here's a pie. I'm sorry that you're having some of these troubles in the neighborhood. Just so you know, we're not all like that. And most of us are here to support you. Here, have this pie and let me know if there's anything I can do to make your transition to this neighborhood more comfortable. That's what she would want to do. That's what you would do, right? But the problem was that's not how they were greeted in Levittown. They were greeted by two weeks of rioting, two weeks of rioting out front of their house, bricks thrown through their house, um, crosses burned in their yards, uh, slash tires, all types of terrorism that uh, that befell the Myers family. But not only that, and this is the part that's even more insidious is that the woman who bakes the pie and delivers that, she gets crosses burned in her yard. Her family's now terrorized. She doesn't get the opportunity to have afternoon tea with the ladies. Her kids can't play with the other neighborhood kids. None of that. So now her whole life is uprooted because of her kindness to a stranger. And this is the problem that we have because knowing what she knows in terms of what happened to the last family that was nice to the Myers family, she might think twice about delivering that pie. She might say something like, I don't have any problems with the Myers family, but I sure don't want any problems myself. And that's exactly the problem. That's the challenge we have is because we're not willing to speak up for what's right en masse. Because for me, I'm like, I'm like Anne Frank. You know, despite everything, at heart, I believe everyone's good, or I believe that most people are good, right? And I do believe that, I do. The problem is that people don't speak up at the level that they need to, to affect positive change in our community. And what happens is to, you know, as Dr. King said in talking about the civil rights movement, he said this time will not be remembered by the violence and vitriol of the bad people but rather by the appalling silence of the good people. And that's true. That was true of 1925. That was true of 1945. That was certainly true of Levittown 1957. And that's true of the United States in 2022. There's this appalling silence of the good people that allows for the violence and vitriol of the bad people to win the day. And then the perception becomes that everybody feels this way. Everybody in the group feels like these loudest voices, this vocal minority. And we've got a quiet majority who's sitting back, not having their voices be heard. And that is what harms our communities. So that's Levittown, that's 1957. So moving on from there, we get to um, the Saturday Evening Post. This was 1959. When a Negro Moves Next Door. Okay, so this is an article that they felt the need to publish in the Saturday Evening Post because of what I just said. Most people don't know uh, African-Americans, didn't know African-Americans at the time. And I say don't know because, I, you know, there's in a lot of our communities, not a whole lot has changed. 
Um, but here, what they said in this article, they said, hey, look, Black folks are just like you. They want to raise their family. They want to put food on the table. They want to send their kids to school. They want to live their lives just like you. You should welcome them into your community. Estelle Sachs, pictured here, she's a realtor in Baltimore. She was saying that same message. She was beating that drum, saying, hey, look, we cannot give in to these blockbusters and the fear that they are peddling. We've got to protect our communities by welcoming and embracing diversity. Only then are we going to, uh, are we going to, are, are we going to be able to work together in a unified way to, um, to improve property values and really you know, embody that sense of community, right? So that, you know, she was unsuccessful, I got to say, in many ways, because the blockbusters did win the day. The blockbusters did, you know, buy these properties on the cheap and sell them on the, on, you know, at an inflated price, and it destroyed neighborhoods. It really destroyed neighborhoods all across our country. So anybody recognize any of these towns here? You might, you might. Well, let me tell you, these towns are all, all towns in Orange County. So these are all towns in Orange County, but there's something a little bit more um, unique about these towns. And um, what, what these are, these are all places that are known to have been what we call sundown towns. So these places may or may not have had signs, many of them would have had signs before you get into town that says, hey, if you are black or if you are Hispanic or if you're not white, you better not let the sun set on you in name the town, right? And this was happening all over the country as well. And this was a response to the federal, the, the uh, Supreme Court making those restrictive covenants uh, not enforceable by law and, um, you know, not enforceable by law. So residents, neighbor, neighborhoods were taking, the mat taking matters into their own hands. And that's when they were, they created these sundown towns. And again, this is part of the reason why so many of our communities all over the country are still segregated because these signs, um, even though they were taken down, the attitude still existed. You know, I, you know, I talk with realtors all over the country about this, and sometimes they'll tell me, they'll say, yeah, I remember growing up. We had a sign just like that, you know, in the entrance to our town. I remember that sign. It was still there in the 70s. Some cases, it was still there in the 80s, believe it or not. We saw these signs all over the, all over, all over the nation. Um, so this is something that makes it very difficult for us to get to uh, the next level in terms of really welcoming inclusion into all of our communities. Here's, um, here's one about Brea. Brea used to have a law that no Black person could live in town here after six o'clock. See, Fullerton had its colored section. Um, Placentia at that time was predominantly a Mexican town, but for years there were no Black people in Brea at all. The shoeshine man was black, but he had to leave town by six o'clock. It was an illegal law, of course. If you'd gone to the Supreme Court, um, we never had them in school. I never had a black person in the school the whole time I was superintendent or principal. I don't know if the high school did. And this is from a former resident of Rhea, right? And this is from sundown towns. So again, this is something that's not unique to other parts of the country. It was alive and well in Orange County alive and well, which brings us to um, another thing that was alive and well in California uh, during that period of time. So here we've got the Rumford Fair Housing Act. So we've got, um, we, we've got, we've got a situation here where uh, William Byron Rumford, who was the first African-American from Northern California to serve in the legislature, and this is the state legislature, and there was a desire to bring forward fair housing in California. So this was 1963. So this was before the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which is the federally recognized act. And this is in California. So this was a very 
progressive, forward thinking uh, thing to do. And it was great because it, what it said is that landlords could not deny housing because of ethnicity, religion, or national origin. And then later the law was uh, amended to uh, apply to sex, marital status, a physical handicap, and familial status. So yes, it's like, all right, yay, California. All right. So we've got a Fair Housing Act, um, except for we showed up. And what I mean by we showed up, we as the realtors. The realtor showed up again, and guess what we've got? We've got Proposition 14. You see the woman holding the sign that said, Realtors foster bigotry. That is a true statement in 1964. That's a true statement. We have to own that. And that's one of the challenges that we have is so many of us don't want to own that. We don't want to own the sort of history and past that we have as realtors and how instrumental we were in creating inequitable outcomes. We don't want to own that, but we have to own that. We have to atone for that so that we can all move forward together, all of us. Because in 1964, the California Real Estate Association, later known as California Association of Realtors sponsored the initiative constitutional amendment that basically counteracted all of the effects of the Rumford Act. Proposition 14 was certified and basically was said that no state nor any subdivision uh, no, or, no, or no agency could um, limit the rights of any person to rent their property to whomever they desire. Orange County voted overwhelmingly to support Proposition 14. Most of California did, much of California did. And as a result, you know, you, we saw uh, housing that was starting to move towards equality in California revert back, revert back. And that was thanks to us as realtors who sponsored this amendment, uh, Proposition 14. The child, who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. That's an African proverb. And that brings us to the 1960s. So now we are uh, at the Watts Rebellion picture there, 1965. Dr. King said that the civil unrest that we see across our nation, uh, it's environmental and not racial. The economic dep deprivation, social isolation, inadequate housing, and general despair of thousands of Negroes teeming in Northern and Western ghettos are the ready seeds which give birth to tragic expressions of violence. And that was true. That's what was happening. Because at every opportunity, when we started to see people of color and other minorities start to gain ground towards equality, we were pushed back. We were pushed back. So then that takes us to the 1966 Chicago Freedom Festival that Martin Luther King had. He went to Chicago and said, hey, what's going on here? Because, you know, we understand that housing isn't fair in the South, but it's also not fair in the North either. Now, this is a problem because Chicagoans and other Northerners were happy to wag their fingers at the Southerners and say, you got to treat your Black folks better. They love to do that. But once Dr. King came north and started to expose what was taking place in the northern states, he was met with all types of violence. Dr. King said that, you know, in his time in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and other southern states, he'd never experienced the level of violence that he experienced in Chicago. And that's because he was pulling the curtains back on what was transpiring there. And once he pulled those curtains back, um, people didn't really like what they saw, uh, or people didn't like what was exposed, I should say. Dr. King, for example, was able to rent an apartment during his time in Chicago, and that apartment was, he paid $50 a month for it, and for $50 a month, he got a three-room shack. It was dark and dingy, you know, poor lighting, you know, no parks, you know, nothing, well, it just wasn't a quality neighborhood. And that was the best he could get. That was the only thing that he could find that would rent to him as a black family. Now, as he was touring, touring around Chicago, he got to see where some of the white families were able to live. And 
you know, they were getting five and six room palatial apartments, bright and airy, you know, good schools, um, you know, parks and playgrounds and, you know, well-maintained, updated, all of that good stuff. And they were paying $40 a month, 40. So not only were African-Americans and other minorities paying more, but they were getting a heck of a lot less for what they were paying for than what their white counterparts were getting. Um, and that was what was exposed by Dr. King when he went north uh, during the Freedom Festival in 1966. So that led to his assassination, that among a lot of the other work that he did, of course. And that took us to 1968. So in 1968, after the death, of Dr. Martin Luther King, Lyndon Johnson took advantage of an opportunity, never let a good tragedy go to waste because what he was able to get done was the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which was being stalled, stalled in Congress for years, for years, but he was finally able to take advantage of what the nation was going through at that time and get this passed. So here we are, 1968, what we know is that the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, and national origin. We know that is the Fair Housing Act. So there we have it. And you might be thinking, Nate, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said that, you know, you, you, we had a Civil Rights Act in 1866, 100 years ago, 100 years before 1968. That didn't solve the problem. What makes us think that we're going to solve it right now in 1968? How is this going to solve it? Well, part of the reason that the 1866 bill didn't have the effect that one would have desired was because there was no teeth behind it. There was no enforcement for, um, for you know, no, no enforcement mechanisms there. So as a result, nothing happened. People continued to discriminate because there was no recourse. But in 1968, it's a little bit different. Because now we've got a case study. We've got a, we've got a Supreme Court case. We've got the Jones family versus Alfred H. Mayer Company. So the Jones family, African-American family, wanted to buy a brand new home from Alfred H. Mayer Company. Mayer said, ah, you're black, can't sell you a house. Now, the question is, can't sell you a house or won't sell you a house? Well, that's debatable. People debate that to this very day. And you know, some would argue that the mayor company wanted to be sued because they wanted to challenge. They wanted this to be challenged so that they could open up housing opportunities to everyone. But the reality was that there was FHA financing. This was an FHA product uh, project, so they funded the infrastructure and all of that. So it was mandated that they have those restrictive covenants that say that, you know, no black folks, no Hispanics um, shall occupy these properties. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, not only does the mayor company have to sell the Jones family a home, but they also have to pay all of their legal fees. So there we have it, we've got a win. 1968. So now we've got all races, all colors. We've got all religions and all national origins, holding hands, singing Kumbaya, racism, housing discrimination in America is a thing of the past. What a glorious day. I, yeah, you guys aren't all with me on that. And you, you're right, because we didn't quite get there in 1968. Didn't quite get there. Um, but it was all good, unless you're a woman, right? Because it wasn't until 1974 that the Housing and Community Development Act was passed, which amended the Fair Housing Act to include sex as a protected class. 1974, people, 1974. That was not very long ago not very long ago at all. And it would have been perfectly legal prior to the passage of this act for someone to say, I'm not gonna rent you this apartment because you're a woman. 
or I'm not going to sell you this house because you're a woman. Go get your daddy. Go get your brother. Perfectly legal. And what's funny, what's, and it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. We're talking about 1974, folks. The United States Congress, they were debating whether or not they should force people to rent houses and sell houses to women. One of the arguments that was being made was that we can't sell houses to women. We can't rent houses to women. Women can't keep up the homes like men can. So if we rent houses to women, it's going to destroy property values in the neighborhood because they can't keep up the property. 1974, this was being debated, and that was the argument. Fortunately, that did not win the day. The Fair Housing Act was amended to include sex as a protected class. So now we've got all races, all religions, all national origins, all colors. We've got men and women holding hands, singing Kumbaya. It's all good, unless you're in a wheelchair. Because it wasn't until 1988 that the Fair Housing Amendments Act was passed and that added disability and familial status. 1988. So prior to the passage of this Amendments Act, it was perfectly legal to say, mm, no kids allowed here. I don't want any kids, they're too loud. Ah, no, you're in a wheelchair. Wheelchair scratching my walls. I don't want to rent to you. This is a quiet area. I don't, we, don't, we don't want any kids around here. Perfectly legal. 1988, folks, in the United States. It's not that long ago. 1988. Madonna had hits in 1988. It was just not that long ago. But yet that was what we were debating at the time. Fortunately, there was some good sense that prevailed. Paul Longmore said, Prejudice is a far greater problem than any impairment. Discrimination is a bigger obstacle to overcome than any disability. And that's where we land today. So we've got our seven protected classes. You know, we've got um, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, handicap, and familial status. Those are the seven federally recognized protected classes. Now, of course, our National Association of Realtors, we have two additional classes that we recognize, and those are sexual identity and, um, uh, excuse me, gender identity and sexual orientation. Those are the two additional protected classes that are recognized by the National Association of Realtors and our Code of Ethics. Now it's been said over the last couple of years that the Fair Housing Act includes sexual orientation and gender identity through the sex category, but it isn't explicit in terms of an actual class uh, that is protected. So there's still some work to do there, folks. So, so you know, What's a disability? We know what a disability is. A disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more late major life activities, walking, seeing, learning, working, or having a record of or being regarded as having such an impairment. That takes us to a case. We've got a case study here. Um, so uh, Anderson fa family versus the city of Blue Ash. Now, the Anderson family, they have a daughter and their daughter has mobility issues and they use the services of a miniature horse to get around the backyard. And um, the city of Blue Ash says, I mean, there's no farm animals allowed in Blue Ash. You got to get rid of that horse, kid. And well, we need the horse to get around. I don't care. So we went to court. And the court decided, and the court decided that the Anderson family could keep the horse. They could keep the horse. And as a result of that decision, 
Well, we know that as, as a um, reasonable accommodation. So in fair housing, in terms of disability, we've got two things. We've got reasonable modifications and reasonable accommodation. Uh, accommodation. So a reasonable modification would be something like adding grab bars to a home to help somebody get around. Reasonable modification would be allowing a horse or allowing a, sir, another service animal. By the way, there are only two types of animals that are classified as service animals. Uh, that those are dogs and miniature horses. Now that's different than a support animal. Support animals can be, you know, can be anything. So that, so that is a little, that is different. So that's, that's where we, um, that's where we, um, that's, that's where we, uh, that's where we are so far in terms of the Fair Housing Act. Now, let's talk about familial status for a moment. Not everybody's clear on that. Familial status refers to the presence or potential presence of a person under the age of 18 in the home. So it has nothing to do with marital status or, or any of that. It specifically has to do with children. It has to do with the presence or a potential presence of a person under the age of 18 in the home. So as I mentioned, that's where we are today. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, and familial status. So any questions or, or thoughts at this point? Love to answer some questions uh, you know, from, from, from some of you fine folks in Orange County. Anybody got a thought, some questions? All right, well, we will continue. Hopefully somebody will come up with a question or two as we move along. So when are protected classes not protected? Well, protected classes are not protected. Um, if you are the owner occupant of a building or property that's less than four units or, and you own less than four units, you may um, express a preference for particular groups of folks, for example, gender, uh, sex is not, is something you could say that, you know, if you've got a duplex, I'm going to rent the other side of my duplex to, I only want a man living there, or I only want a woman living there, whatever the case may be. That's your prerogative. You can do that. Not you because you're realtors and we as realtors can't do that. Um, but we um, also, provided the person doesn't advertise as well, uh, those are the kind of, or use the services of a real estate professional. So that's the criteria for that. Also with age. So we've got federally recognized 55 and older communities and 62 and older communities. Those are both areas that are excluded or you know, are exempt from uh, the protections of the Federal Fair Housing Act. But having said that, no matter what, we may never, ever, ever discriminate based on race. And that takes us all the way back to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. That's what causes us not to be able to discriminate based on race. So we've covered a couple of things. We talked about blockbusting, um, inducing homeowners to sell at reduced prices by inferring that the imminent entry into their neighborhood of persons of a particular race will devalue their properties. We talked about redlining, denying or restricting loans to or in a particular area or community. Talked about steering a little bit. Steering is channeling home seekers to or away from particular areas. That's steering. So in terms of reporting acts of discrimination, so if the party discriminating is your client or is not a client of any other real estate agent, then talk to the party and explain fair housing and ask them to stop. If, they can, if, um, if the party discriminating is a client of another agent, talk to the agent, express your concerns and ask the agent to speak with the client and ask them to stop the discriminatory behavior. Now, if the discrimination does not cease and the discriminating party is your client, in the relationship with the client, terminate the listing, inform the homeowner about what occurred and state your belief that discrimination was involved. 
If it's not your client, inform the home buyer about what occurred and state your belief that discrimination was involved. Follow up with a letter to the home buyer and summarizing the discussion. And if it's another realtor who's discriminating, then in addition to what I've just stated, you can file an ethics complaint with your local board and uh, you know, alleging violation of Article 10 of the Code of Ethics. And some places that you can report acts of discrimination, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. You got the National Fair Housing Alliance. You got the uh, Fair Housing of Orange County is another resource for you as well. So those are some spaces where you can, where you can, um, where you can report some acts of discrimination. So let's talk a little bit about bias. Let's talk a little bit about bias. And again, anybody has any thoughts or questions, throw it on in there. So we've got a couple of kinds of bias that I wanna dis discuss with you. Um, we've got explicit bias, which is, it refers to the attitudes and beliefs that we have about a person or a group at a conscious level. So with an explicit bias, we're aware of it, okay? We know that we have it. Um, you know, if I say that, I don't like something, I know I don't like it, it or you know, I'm aware that I don't like it, or that I like something, I know that I like that something. So that's explicit bias. We're clear on what we like and what we don't like. There's another type of bias. And this type of bias is much more insidious because with this type of bias, what we call implicit bias, we're not even aware of it. So implicit bias refers to the attitudes, refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. That's implicit bias. So these are things that we like or don't like, and we don't, we're not even aware that we're doing it or that we have that, that preference or lack of preference. So let me give you an example what that looks like. So an example that I love to use, ice cream, okay? I love ice cream. We all love ice cream, right? Everybody loves ice cream. Um, so we love, you know, so if you ask me, you, you ask uh, explicit bias, Nate. Okay, so I'm gonna be explicit bias, Nate. You say, hey, explicit bias, Nate. Um, do you like ice cream? And I say, yeah. Explicit bias Nate loves ice cream. You say, what kind of ice cream do you like? Explicit bias Nate. Oh, well, I love strawberry. I love chocolate, uh, vanilla ice cream. Uh, anybody like um, Rocky Road ice cream? It's gross. It's disgusting. So I'm clear on what I like and don't like. I like strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla ice cream, but I don't like Rocky Road ice cream or any other nasty ice cream with nuts in it. So that's my explicit bias, okay? So now what does that look like if, I, if, if that were an implicit bias? If there were an implicit bias? So if it were an implicit bias, you ask me the same question. You say, hey, Nate, do you like ice cream? And of course, yeah, I love ice cream. Love it, love it. Do you have a favorite kind of ice cream, you ask me? And I say, no, I don't have a favorite kind of ice cream. I love all ice cream equally. And you say, really? Because you've heard differently about me. And you heard that Rocky Road ice cream I don't really like. I treat Rocky Road ice cream a little bit differently. So to decide to hire a consultant to conduct an independent study of my ice cream eating habits. And this is what the consultant says. This is what we're gonna do, we're gonna set up an ice cream bar. So every day for lunch, we've got strawberry, chocolate, and Rocky Road ice cream, okay? So this is a week. So every day that week, I, ro I rotate back and forth. I eat strawberry ice cream one day, ooh, and then I eat chocolate ice cream the next day, go back to strawberry ice cream, then go back to chocolate ice cream. But I never touch that Rocky Road ice cream. So then after that first week, 
you come to me and say, hey, Nate, are you sure you don't have any preferences or aversions to any types of ice cream? And I said, no, I, I told you all ice cream equal. I like all ice cream equally. And he said, huh, okay. So then the next week, you just leave up strawberry ice cream and Rocky Road ice cream. Every day that week, I eat strawberry ice cream. I never touch the Rocky Road ice cream. So you come to me again after the second week. Nate, ice cream, are you sure you don't have an aversion towards anything? And now I'm getting upset. I'm feeling attacked. I told you, I don't have any preferences for ice cream. I don't, I like all ice cream equally. I don't even see flavor, right? You say, okay, all right. So then the third week, the third week, you leave out the Rocky Road that Cassie didn't eat all of. You eat all of the, you leave out, you leave out just the Rocky Road ice cream. And every day that week, I have a brownie instead. I don't even touch the ice cream. So now you've got proof or, you know, you've got some sort of proof from the consultant that says, hey, you know what? Nate's got a bias against Rocky Road ice cream, folks. So then you bring me the study. You sit me down and you explain the results to me. And I begin to cry. I begin to cry because I genuinely believed that I didn't have any aversions. I didn't treat any ice cream differently. I treat all ice cream the same. I don't even see flavor. But what you found is that that's just not true. I avoid Rocky Road ice cream when I can. And this is my implicit bias. Now that implicit bias has become you know, explicit. So now that it's explicit, I can work to counter that. Because as I'm crying there, I'm thinking about, wow, what are other times that I may not be aware that I've treated Rocky Road ice cream differently than strawberry and vanilla and chocolate? You know, um, when Rocky Road calls me and inquires about real estate, perhaps I am a little bit colder to Rocky Road and maybe I'm a little shorter and a little awkward in the conversation than I am with, with uh, strawberry and vanilla and chocolate. You know, I was hiring somebody in my office not long ago. Rocky Road came in for an interview. I didn't hire him. It just didn't feel right. Strawberry and chocolate and vanilla, it just felt right. See? So I never you know, would say that I don't like Rocky Road ice cream. I have any problems with Rocky Road ice cream. In fact, I'm a champion of diversity in ice cream flavors. But the reality is that I'm treating different types of ice cream differently. And when we do that, that obviously creates adverse outcomes for us in real estate. And we can say that we're going to treat everybody the same, but we're just not aware oftentimes of our own implicit biases. There's a great test, Harvard University, type in Harvard implicit. It'll come right up. Google that. It'll come up and you can take a test and it'll help you discover some of your own uh, implicit biases. Because only once we're aware that these implicit biases exist, are we able to take proactive steps to counter them? Because now that I'm aware that I've got an explicit bias against Rocky Road ice cream, I could call up Rocky Road ice cream and you know, try to schedule a meeting and really work to get to know Rocky Road ice cream, understand their hopes, dreams, and fears. You know, what makes them tick? You know, and I probably find out that Rocky Road's just like all the other ice creams. And they've got different lived experiences, like all of us have different lived experiences. But by getting to know Rocky Road ice cream, I'm going to be less likely to treat them differently the next time I encounter them. And that's what we want to do as realtors. We want to ensure that we are creating equitable outcomes for everyone that we encounter. And we have to do that in a purposeful way because it doesn't work to just say, I don't see color. I don't discriminate. That doesn't solve it. 
that doesn't solve it. We have to be proactive in ensuring that we're doing things that, um, that, that align with equality. And that's where the Equal Professional Services Act comes in, the National Association of Realtors. And we've got a couple of other things, and we'll talk about that Equal Professional Services uh, um, protocol that NAR has. Let me tell you, the average American male is five foot nine inches tall. That's true. This is all true, by the way. The average Fortune 500 CEO is nearly six foot tall. 14 and a half percent of Americans are over six foot tall. However, 58% of Fortune 500 CEOs are over six foot tall. 4% of American males are over six foot two inches tall. However, 30% of Fortune 500 CEOs are over six foot two inches tall. Why do you think that is? Do we think that people who are taller or are more capable of being Fortune 500 CEOs? Is that what we believe? Well, yeah, we do, because the numbers show it. The numbers show it. And no one would say that, hey, we're hiring a Fortune 500 CEO. Don't apply unless you're you know, six foot tall. Nobody would say that, of course. But what happens is we put people in a position to be successful based on some of these criteria, and we do it implicitly. And because we put them in positions to have that level of success, you know, they move up the ladder. So for example, you know, if you've got Tom and Susie, Tom and Susie, both equally qualified, both went to the same grade school, you know, both remarkably, um, you know, um, um, smart and eager and go-getters. What happens is that Tom might get asked to go play around the golf with a couple of the, couple of the guys in the executive suite. Susie probably isn't getting asked to play golf like that. Tom is, you know, asked to go have a drink with the, some of the guys after work, Susie might not get that same ask. Susie doesn't get that ask. Also, in many cases, other minorities aren't gonna get that same ask either. So what happens is that somebody who's in charge of making decisions gets to know Tom a little bit more. And as a result, they say, you know that next project, Let's let let's put Tom in charge of that. Let's see what let's see what he can do. And Tom does a great job. Tom does a great job. It's not that Tom was able to get opportunities that he didn't deserve. Tom has worked hard. The reality here is that and he took advantage of that opportunity. But Susie didn't get that opportunity. So Susie was disadvantaged because she was a woman in that example because she wasn't in the in-group with Tom and Tom got that advantage. Again, Tom worked hard for everything that he got, but the little advantage that he had pushed him over the top and resulted in him becoming the next CEO of that company 15, 20 years down the road because of those little opportunities that those little advantages that some groups get that others don't. We've got we to be cognizant of that and figure out ways that we can level the playing field and give equal opportunities to everyone because that, that really, really, you know, works to leverage the richness that diversity in our country has and can provide. So this is Catherine Graham. She became the first woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company in 1972. Here's Franklin Raines. He became the first African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company. This was in 1999. By the way, Catherine Graham, 1972, two years before, she, uh, before it was illegal to deny her the opportunity to, um, 
get her own housing. As of November 2020, there are 41 women that are Fortune 500 CEOs, 8.2%. And as of February 21, there are four African-American CEOs, less than 1%. So you say 41 CEOs, 8.2%. Yeah, women are about 10% of the population. That makes sense. Of course, we know women aren't about 10% of the population. Women represent over 50% of the population. So that number should be a lot more, uh, 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 a lot closer to that 50% number than it is. And we've just discussed some of the reasons that that occurs. Again, it's up to us to work to create better outcomes. And we, of course, can help this in a real estate space. So pictured here, this is Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, uh, he's an author and uh, he's got a great podcast. He's one of my favorite authors. And, you know, in his book, Blink, he talks about micro impressions that we have. And one of the stories that he tells is about the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. And in this orchestra, they said that they really want to get a woman violin player because this is in the 80s apparently in the 80s up to the 80s women just weren't in orchestras so unless you were playing the harp or a flute maybe a delicate instrument that was perceived to be more feminine maybe um, you weren't you just weren't in the orchestra you weren't playing the violin certainly um, that was just the way that it was uh, in terms of world-class orchestras but they said, man, we're, the, we're one of the best orchestras in the world. We need to do better. We need to be embracing diversity and, and inclusion uh, in terms of gender. But the women just aren't as good as the men. We can't trot out an inferior product. Our patrons won't stand for that. So... Someone said, well, you know, maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to test this. Maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to interview people a little bit differently in our auditions. So with their auditions, what they decided to do was do a blind audition. So they put screens up and they had the folks come out and interview, they had to take off their shoes and everything and audition. Uh, so nobody could tell whether they were a man or a woman. So they said, all right, uh, contestant number 33, come on out. You're our first choice. Number 33 comes out. It was a woman. Yes, it was a woman. They were shocked. They're like, yes, we found her. We found the woman that is as good as the men. Where has she been hiding? Contestant number 27, come on out. It's another woman. Or it's their second choice. Another woman. Number 68, come out. A third woman. Just like that. Bam, bam, bam. Where have all these women been hiding? Right? Where have they all been hiding? Of course they weren't hiding. They've always been as good as the men or better. It's just that people had this bias this implicit bias that said that women aren't as good as the men. And although they heard differently, their lion eyes couldn't cause them to select the woman because they just felt she had to be inferior to the men. Because Anais Nin says, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. And that's what we've got to work to do. And again, that brings us to that equal professional services model, which I'm gonna go over in just a moment. Another thing that we have, I talked about implicit bias. We also have identity anxiety. Identity anxiety is a stress response that we get before or during a cross-group interaction. So what happens here is that in-group members fear that their words or actions could be perceived as biased and it shows up in shorter interactions, awkward attempts to connect, cognitive fatigue. I, you know, all of those things happen to the in-group members and it creates adverse outcomes. 
So out-group members may also have stress and anxiety associated with this. They fear that they could experience discrimination, hostile treatment, or invalidation. So can you imagine that? How tough that is? You've got a member of the in-group, and when I talk about the in-group, what I'm saying is anyone who represents most of the people in the room, and you know, uh, the member of the out group is someone who obviously is in the minority of the group. So you've got a member of the in group who's having this interaction with the person from the out group. The member of the in, in group, you know, is concerned that that they may, you know, that their words and actions may be perceived as bias. So they end up with these shorter interactions. The member of the out group feels that they're going to experience discrimination. So as a result, they, you know, maybe act differently. So you've got this powder keg that explodes and it's because we don't know each other, because we don't spend enough time with each other. So think about how that works when we get into, when we get into um, real estate meetings, when we're meeting with folks that are, that may be different than the folks that we normally meet with that could result in an awkward conversation. We, that stress response could cause us to act inappropriately and treat someone differently. That's a problem. We've got to overcome that. And we need to be purposeful about having different types of interactions. That's how we're going to uh, neutralize the identity anxiety uh, that could occur. Then we've got another one that I want to talk about briefly is stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is, um, you know, it, it, it deals with, it, it deals with the, um, a stress response that we get before or during a cross group interaction. So here I've got Jerry Kang, he's a UCLA professor and um, he's got a, he kind of, I think, I think that his take on identity anxiety here quickly uh, will be beneficial to us. So let's take a listen to this. When there are negative stereotypes about the groups that you belong to in the air, it can interfere with your actual performance because of the anxiety that if you do poorly, you will confirm the negative rep about your people. So think about it, like, what does that mean for me? Like, so I'll let, let's say I'm like on Wilshire Boulevard, I have to parallel park. It's a lot of pressure, right? People are honking, all the kinds of stuff. People are looking at me. It's the Asian guy, can he parallel park? Can he pull this off? You might think like, well, I didn't know of that stereotype. Like, come to LA, right? So, you know, it's either I'm like fast and furious doing kind of donuts at Japanese races, or I can't parallel park. It's one or the other, right? You have no idea what I'm talking about. So I watch bad movies. So, um, so the idea is, does it create a certain kind of anxiety that leads me to choke on performances? And you might think, well, why, why would that happen? Uh, and what's the mechanism? The mechanism seems to be all kinds of things, including increasingly a disruption of what we call working memory, which is really important to do challenging tasks. Let me okay, so that's identity anxiety. Excuse me, stereotype threat. Stereotype threat. So stereotype threat is, is what uh, Jerry King was discussing what he was talking about. And as you can see, it could create an awkward, an awkward interaction. Um, there was a Stanford University study where uh, these uh, psychologists gave tests to African-American students in Stanford University. Half the students, they were asked to identify their race. The other half of the students, they were not asked to identify their race. The students that were asked to identify their race did not perform as well as the students who were not asked to identify their race. And that's because of stereotype threat. And African-Americans have been taught and influenced all of our lives that we're intellectually inferior to our white counterparts. Although, we don't believe it. If you were to ask me or ask anyone, any other African-American, they would say, no, that's not true. That's ridiculous. But 
when it comes down to it, that's an implicit belief that we may have about ourselves. And it shows up in poorer performance, as Jerry Kang just spoke about in terms of the stereotype that exists among uh, uh, Asians as it relates to driving. This is also true of, uh, there was a Harvard University study where um, they had uh, white long jumpers. And we've all heard the, uh, the, the saying or stereotype, white men can't jump. And um, what they did was, is they had the white long jumpers being judged by two groups. They had, they had white long jumpers being judged by black judges, and they had the white long jumpers being judged by white judges. The ones that per, were being judged by black judges performed not as well as when they were being judged by white judges. And that is because of that stereotype threat. So they see the black judge and they say, I'm not as good as him in terms of being uh, physically proficient and athleticism. So as a result, they don't perform as well in complete, completing that task. So although if you ask these long jumpers, world-class long jumpers, they would say, no, I'm just as good as them. But when the rubber meets the road, that stereotype threat that they have causes them to uh, have an adverse outcome. So I talked a little bit about um, in-group and out-group dynamics. So with the in-group preference, you know, the in-group is if, if, if we're in the in-group, we tend to have a preference for folks that are, are, are like us, okay? We gravitate to these folks. So if we're in a meeting or in a cocktail party and there's folks, we're gonna gravitate towards the folks that are more like us. And that when I say us, whoever you are, that could be a group of realtors that are in a building with engineers. We're probably gravitating towards the realtors. That could be a group of black folks um, and when there's very few white folks or mostly white folks, very few Hispanic folks, whatever the case may be, in and out, in and out group, okay? So what happens is because the person in the in group sought out somebody that was like them and they didn't take proactive steps to engage with people that were not like them, it can be viewed as it has the same impact as hostility towards that out group. And that's one of the challenges that we've got with these in and out group dynamics. And that's why we've got to really work to be purposeful about our interactions and our engagements. Because if we're not intentionally inclusive, then we're unintentionally exclusive in those spaces. So let's see here. I wanted to make sure that we get to the equal professional service time, uh, service model for the sake of time. I don't wanna lose this point. And these, this is a way that we can work to, to, to ensure that we are um, treating everyone equally in terms of the real estate decisions that we're helping people make. So the equal professional service model asks the question, do I use systematic procedures? Do I have objective information? Has my customer set the limit? And have I offered a variety of choices? Those are some of the questions that, that we want to ask ourselves to ensure that we are implementing the equal professional service model. So systematic procedures. Somebody calls you and says, hey, I want to look at the house on 123 Main Street. What's your response to that? Do you just, you know, what your response to that to one should be your response to all? You know, are you verifying a pre-approval letter? Is that what you, or, you know, have you asked if they spoke with a bank or a lender? What's your po policy? What's your protocol? Because whatever that protocol is, you need to do it every single time. So I would encourage you to develop it if you don't have it in writing and ensure that you're doing it the same way every time with every single prospect that you encounter. Because if you are differing from it and are varying from it, then you could put yourself at risk of 
violating the Federal Fair Housing Act by treating people differently. And even though you say that you treat everyone the same, the reality, and hopefully, hopefully I've showed you today that it's possible that people could get different outcomes based on, uh, based on how you're treating them. You could be doing it in a way that you, don't even, you aren't even aware of, and that could create uh, adverse impact for you. The next question you want to ask yourself is, do I have objective information? Do I have objective information? Do I have a pre-approval letter or don't I have a pre-approval letter? That's objective information. Has my customer set the limits? Did the customer tell me that they wanted to be in this part of town instead of this part of town? Or did I make that choice for them? Because what we know is that the client makes the choice and we give the client the choice and the client makes the decision. Okay, we give the client the choices and they make the decision. Have I offered a variety of choices? Have I given them all the real estate that's available that meets the criteria that they've set up for themselves? Have I followed their instructions? So as we implement that equal professional services model, that really helps in terms of ensuring that we are treating everyone equally in a real estate space. And it keeps us on the right side of fair housing laws. So as we continue our sort of, uh, you know, let's fast forward in time a little bit because we still have a lot of issues that, that we contend with. Um, so this one in, is in Texas. So this is the Texas Department of Housing Community Affairs versus Inclusive Communities Project. And what they found, and this is a disparate impact suit. And what they, what they found is that 92.2% of low-income housing tax credit union units in the city of Dallas are located in census tracts with less than 50% Caucasian residents. Why is that? That's because people who are making the decisions are putting poor people on top of more poor people, and that's creating adverse outcomes. Instead of spreading the affordable housing around the community, they're concentrating it in certain areas. Uh, of course, you can't do that because it does create a disparate impact. 2016, because of widespread racial and ethnic disparities in the U.S. criminal justice system, criminal history-based restrictions on access to housing are likely disproportionately to burden African Americans and Hispanics. This is what HUD had to say. Um, so what we know is that although African Americans make up just 12% of the U.S. population, we represent 36% of the prison population. Now, I could spend a couple hours, just probably not a couple hours, but at least an hour talking just about the US criminal justice system and how it adversely impacts um, minority citizens in our country. And when we look at the sort of privatization of prisons, that's part of it. But if we go all the way back to the 1800s again, 1860s, what we see is that you know a lot of this started from the prison leasing program because once um, the enslaved people were freed in our country, we've got plantation owners that needed this labor. So that's where all these vagrancy laws came up where people are being arrested for sleeping on the street, being arrested for just not having a job, that sort of thing. And then they would be leased back to the very plantation owners that once owned them as slaves. And that has continued and has continued. The United States imprisons a larger percentage of its population than any other industrialized country in the world. So that's something that we can do better at. We can do better. Bank of America and Wells Fargo versus city of Miami. This is 2017. And what occurred here is that Supreme Court said, hey, banks can sue, excuse me, cities can sue these banks for their discriminatory lending practices. And this is in the lead up to the Great Recession, um, where the predatory lending. And what was found is that these banks were targeting minority communities for, uh, with, these, with their, with their uh, predatory lending products because they'd make more money doing that. And it destroyed wealth in so many communities all across the country, all across the country. There's emails that were leaked that talked about these ghetto loans that they were pushing on people. 
over 50% of minorities that received predatory loans during that period of time would have qualified for conforming conventional products. So it was a targeted effort to, um, to, to, to go after certain parts of our community. Facebook, anybody heard of Facebook? A couple of you? Okay, all right, fantastic. So Facebook, if we go to 2016, we talk, we can see that we've got behaviors. We've got um, interest, buying a house, first time buying, house hunting, narrow the audience. Afri we're going to uh, exclude African-Americans, Asian-Americans and Hispanics. So this is a how advertisement for housing that Facebook said, your audience is great. This is 2016 and here's what the ad would look like. So the ad is approved and the housing goes out there, okay? Uh, here's another one. Your interest, uh, your, your, your interest, corporate moms, stay-at-home moms, new moms. Uh, so discriminating based on familial status, Braille, wheelchair accessible, American Sign Language, discriminating based on disability, Judaism, the Jewish home, et cetera, discriminating based on religion. Um, and that was all approved by Facebook. So in 2018, HUD files a complaint and says that, hey, Facebook, you can't be doing that. That's illegal. You're discriminating in housing. Facebook says, hey, no, 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 we'll fix it. We'll fix it. We're sorry, sorry. So sorry. We didn't know. We'll fix it. But yet, 2019, HUD actually charged them with it because they still hadn't fixed it. This is March of 2019, folks. Facebook is discriminating against people based on who they are and where they live. Using a computer to limit a person's housing choices can be just as discriminatory as slamming a door in someone's face. Zillow, you heard of Zillow? Same thing, neighborhood description, totally Caucasian, quiet, friendly place to raise your children. I will not rent to other ethnicities other than Caucasian. So don't inquire if you ain't white, white only. Newsday did a three-year investigative study that showed that in Long Island, where Levittown is, by the way, if you're Asian, you have a 19% chance of being shown different homes than your white counterparts. If you're Hispanic, you have a 39% chance of being shown homes in different neighborhoods. And if you are African-American, you have a 49% chance of being shown different homes than your uh, white counterparts. And this is 2019. And this is a three-year investigative study. And what I would argue is that this could happen anywhere in the country and you'll probably find very similar results. And so my point with all of that is that, look, we've come a long way, but we certainly have a long way to go in terms of creating, uh, you know, creating, uh, creating equitable housing opportunities for everyone. Um, so with that, I hope that you all got value out of our conversation today. I think I've got just a, a minute or two left. Uh, you know, if you've, if you've got any questions as we're wrapping up or Cassie, if you've got something or Elsie, uh, uh, anything to share for the, good of the, for the good of the group. But at the end of the day, diversity is the one thing that we all have in common. And we do have to make sure that we're doing everything we can as realtors to create equitable outcomes in our communities because that's what we deserve. That's what our community deserves so that we create the future that we can all be proud of. So thank you so much for having me today. It's been great to spend time with you.